Hi, everyone, and welcome to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. Wendy has spent the last two years helping women with various stages of endometriosis to heal naturally after putting her condition into remission. After her own healing success from stage four endometriosis and adenomyosis, she's inspired to heal others, and her goal is to help some of the 175 million women know that there is another way other than painkillers, drugs, or surgery. This is the place to be for real talk with real people for real results so you can learn how to heal your endometriosis naturally. Please note that the opinions expressed in this program may represent options but are not a substitute for proper medical care. Before starting any new healthcare program, we recommend you consult with a health professional. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Wendy K. Laidlaw here from Heal Endometriosis Naturally. I'm excited, as always, to uh, introduce my next guest, who is Chef Todd Herr, Mur, I beg your pardon, who has very kindly agreed to come on the podcast today to share his culinary skills. And the reason I asked him on here today is because uh, I met with him recently in America, and you know, we've been chatting about women with endometriosis and how sometimes difficult it can be to actually get good, simple, nutritious food inside your body when you're not feeling very well. And Todd was sharing with me some 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 lovely, simple ideas. And obviously, he's had you know great experience in this realm for, for a long time. So I thought it would be quite fun for him to come on and just share. And I know if it's a podcast, you might be thinking, how do I do this? But we're also doing this on video as well. So and maybe, you know, in the next coming months, we can we can do more with Todd and you know get him more involved in how to help us eat really healthily, but simply and have a bit of fun as well. But first of all, Todd, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you, Wendy. I'm, I'm really excited about it, and I hope we can help a lot of people. Absolutely. No, I, I just thought it'd be fun to, to do this, but I thought, first of all, if you can maybe give the listeners and the watchers just some background, what led you into to being a chef? Um, well, I'm, I'm coming from the background of having been an executive chef at a large hospital, um, having to cook across multiple diets because uh, being a restaurant chef, you, you know, you cook the menu, but a hospital chef, any menu I wrote, it had to be done eight different ways, all the way down from the child daycare to the adult uh, daycare and every diet in between. But, you know, I started out just like everybody else. I was a frustrated home cook. I Back when I actually was in advertising, I, I was a, a sales executive, but I would come home and I loved to cook. I enjoyed the entire process of cooking, but to be honest, I was bad at it. You know, I, I had my five basic meals that I could make. It was something that my mom had taught me or my grandma or something I picked up. I find everybody has five meals, you know, that they're confident with, but anytime I tried to stray from one of those five meals, it was disaster, you know, <laughs> Recipes let me down. Food TV shows were, were just entertainment. And I got really frustrated, so much so that I quit my job and enrolled in culinary school at 32 years old. Everybody else, all the other students, like half my age, they, they called me Pops. <laughs> I'm 32. <laughs> you know, and they're calling That's me Pops. awesome. It was, it was silly. But yeah, I, I upended my entire life and I had a lucrative career to go start steaming oysters in the back of a restaurant in Baltimore, Maryland, in, in the U.S., and changed my life entirely. But, you know, I, I found the reason there in culinary school that I, I was constantly failing at cooking, that it never got any better. I never got past any of those five things. It was because in culinary school, they don't teach recipes, but home cooks, they're always told to go find a new recipe. And if you have a diagnosis, a diabetic diagnosis, an endometriosis, a, a gluten-free, any of these diets, once you have a diagnosis, everybody sets out to go find the recipes. But, you know, tomorrow's chefs, they're not being taught recipes. They're being taught methods, yes. basic cooking methods that they repeat again and again and again. That way they work for any ingredient. So, when you know the five steps in basic saute, that, I'm sorry, the nine steps in basic saute, you duplicate those steps again and again, whether it's low fat, gluten free, or heck high fat, you know, <laughs> if you're just cooking with abandon, it doesn't what you eat should not change how you cook. And that was the big epiphany for me. And so how did I get to be executive chef at a large hospital? Um, I, I started taking these ideas into the hospital so that when I got there, 
um, we had one guy making sauces for a, a diabetic diet and then somebody else making sauces for gluten free. There are five people making sauces in this kitchen. And I said, this is silly because how you make sauces is not any different for all these diets. Only the ingredients are. So, you know, from now on, you're going to practice a method and only one cook is going to make sauces. So that's, and that, that's awesome. That's that's, and, that's really nice to hear because I think that's it. I think people overcomplicate things, and you know, and obviously I do have my own cookbook and it does have recipes. So you know, it'd be really interesting to hear more from you today, as you know, when you say you, that these nine basic steps or ingredients for for sauces and things, or um, because that that whole concept of even just shifting of how we look about making food. Um, is fascinating. So can you tell us a bit more about like, you know, what you did with, with the people in the kitchen so that everybody was just doing like the one sauce that could accommodate more, more people? Yes, yeah, certainly. And actually, I just did a, a live video on this this week because so many people at the holidays, um, th- they have all their relatives coming over and invariably you're going to have dietary desires and dietary needs at that table as well. So I did a quick video, if anyone goes to my Facebook page at Chef Todd Moore, T-O-D-D-M-O-H-R, they can see I made uh, sauces in three different diet ways. And that gets back to what I was saying about at the hospital, that, that the cooking methods can be repeatable. So if I have one chef repeating the same method over and over and over again, the first time he does it with butter and flour and makes roux, the second time he does it with coconut oil and potato starch, uh, to get away from a gluten diet. The third time he does it, he does milk with uh, like breadcrumbs and thickens it that way. Uh, the fourth time he goes, so, you know, the method again and again and just the ingredients change kind of thing. And I, I didn't mean to disparage cookbooks and recipes entirely. They no, not are, at all. No. <laughs> well, I mean, they're great for ideas because yeah. they're, they're generally well researched and you can see whether it's for a dietary need, the ingredients are being used. Or just a creative aspect. Oh, look, they put you know those two ingredients yeah. together. But I don't ever trust them for how to cook the <laughs> cooking methods that, that go behind it. Yeah. So, so what is the how then? So, so, so obviously you're passionate. I, I think it's awesome that you changed careers at that stage in your life. That that shows great passion um, for food and for for methods and how wonderful to really step back and look at things differently from a hospital perspective as well, or than having all these different people doing all different things. So what is the how? So if someone's listening to this and they're feeling inspired suddenly because you really understand all the different dietary elements, because for my women with endometriosis, I say no wheat, no wheat, no wheat. So no wheat and gluten is, is a big thing for their intestinal tract. So where would you have them start? Uh, so, you know, I took these ideas that every time I, I spoke with someone about it, that, you know, hey, they say, hey, do you, can you share your recipe with me? I say, I don't have a recipe. Like, How could you not have a recipe? That's insane. <laughs> you know, well, a lot of people's grandparents, grandma cooked like this. They just took whatever fell out of the pantry. They could whip up a great meal from. And I don't know how we've gotten away from this. So I yeah. took this idea of cooking methods and I actually opened a cooking school in outside of Raleigh, North Carolina. And I had a free cooking class on Monday nights. It was a free class. And you know, I knew I had 30 minutes to kind of hook these people and, and show them that I can demonstrate a better way to cook. And when you have people for 30 minutes, and I did promise them a glass of wine at the end, so maybe <laughs> that's why they stuck around. But I knew I had to show them how methods uh, are so much more important than recipes. And I always start with the nine steps in the basic saute method. And it goes like this, very briefly. Step one, pan hot first. A lot of people, home cooks that make the mistake of starting in a cold pan, and this is difficult to, to recover from, to say the least. Pan hot first, then some kind of fat. And it really doesn't matter what kind of fat it is. If it's butter, fine. If you're avoiding dairy for endometriosis, you're using a fat that's right for that diet or a diabetic diet. I mean, obviously, I'm not a nutritionist. I'm not a doctor. I'm a yeah. chef. So they I, I told- recommend coconut, uh, uh, coconut oil for because it's got a high sort of uh, flame point and thing, burn point as well. So it's so good. But yeah, no, that's great. There you go. Okay. Step one, first pan hot. Step two, some kind of fat. Step three, fat hot. This is a second mistake a lot of people make is cooking in a cold fat. Then we have our protein product, and that can be anything from tofu to chicken breast to portobello cap. We'll call that a protein. So pan hot first, some kind of fat, 
fat hot protein product, we cook it 75% on the first side and up to 25% on the second side. Another mistake a lot of home cooks make when they're following a recipe, because if you put it in the pan and just go two, three, four, five and flip it over, then you're just looking at a brown protein product. You've lost all the indicators of whether this is done or not. And so you can, if the longer you let it sit on the first side, the more you can see the rendering of the fat, the more you can see the evaporation of moisture, the more you can see the coagulation of the proteins, you know, it's everything stiffens and shrinks when you cook it, right? Yeah. And so you can touch, you can tell that pan hot first, some kind of fat, fat hot protein product, 75, 25, then we're going to take it out of the pan and you've got that nice caramel color. You've got rendered fats and plus the coconut oil that you put in there. And that's where all the flavor is. People tell me, oh, Chef Todd, I followed the steps and then I washed the pan out. Oh no, this is not the time to wash the pan. That's where all the flavor is. And then what you need is aromatics. This is where your onions, your garlic, celery, carrots, whatever you might want to choose, and you saute them in the rendered fat of the item. So if it's chicken, now you got a beautiful carrot, onion, celery, chicken flavor going on. But you know what? At some point, that pan's going to get too hot. you got to stop the cooking before things start to smoke. And that's when the next step comes in. That's deglazing. You're going to add a liquid to the pan. And a lot of times you see chefs cook with wine. Wine is probably not a good choice for a lot of diets, but maybe it's vegetable broth or, or a chicken broth or stock or juices. Fruit juices work really well. And what this does is drops the temperature of the pan quickly and dramatically. It releases that fond from the bottom of the pan. And there you have a pan sauce that you can either thicken with a thickening agent, a cornstarch slurry, pre-made roux, arrowroot, or even just pureed item like a tomato paste or something. Then you're going to return the protein product to the sauce and let it finish cooking in a moist environment. So if you can do pan hot first, some kind of fat, fat hot, protein product, 7525, uh, remove it to a plate, aromatics, deglaze, reduce or thicken, return the product. If you can do those nine steps over and over and over again, it doesn't matter what diet you're on or what your desires are. So that's what I used to teach in my cooking school. And that's where I start people out with my online classes as well, because this transcends every diet. When you cook in a repeatable fashion, you can change what you're cooking each time. And, and that's what we teach. And it empowers people. Absolutely. Oh, I, I have to say, I can feel myself salivating even like you talking about <laughs> cooking like that. That's wonderful. And I, and I think what I, I, that's why it was so great to have you on because I'm of the same elk. I'm of the same mindset. And cooking doesn't have to be as complicated as we seem to have made it as humans. And even what you describe, I have to say, my children, they love just doing that. You know, I mean... I'm not sure they have the pan as hot as they probably should or the fat as hot as they probably should, but I'll be getting them to listen to this podcast and, and watch this video just to, to remind them. But, but some beautiful meals can be had from just very simple, you know, some like some chicken or meat or protein, some kind of fish or whatever, pan fried, and then just, you know, using the juices that, that it's been done in and adding in. And you've got such a beautiful, fresh, healthy meal. And it doesn't take that long either, far quicker than putting something in the microwave that's been blasted in plastics and then going into oh, no doubt and i mean there is no doubt that when you cook your own food at home you control the ingredients and you control your health i mean it's really that simple and i've done tests in the past between me cooking a meal and ordering takeout or trying to microwave something there's no contest and if you enjoy cooking if you're doing the same thing over and over again you get better at it that's why cooking by method is learning that you actually improve each time you cook with a lot of recipes. If you follow, you try and follow their steps, you're disappointed and you have to relearn cooking every night of the week. This is what creates stress. This is, and you're already fighting a, a, a health issue, a, a diagnosis. And oh my goodness, that's stressful enough. If I can tell you another story, because it, do we still have time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Go for it. Okay. Because I obviously, I can never know the pain of endometriosis that for obvious <laughs> reasons. Yes. Um, but uh, about a year and a half ago, about 18 months ago or so, um, I was having horrible digestive issues. I was bloated. And I mean, I'm in, I'm in good shape. I've always 
prided myself on health and, and eating everything I eat. I'm so picky about everything I eat in that it has to come from a 50 mile radius around me. I shop only at the farmer's market, blah, 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 on and on. And through all of this, I'm feeling terrible and I'm bloated. I had a gut that looked like I sit at a bar and drink beer all day long, you know, and it's just, it was terrible. So my doctor put me on that FODMAP diet. And I can't imagine the pain of endometriosis, but the pain that I had some nights, um, I had, I, oh, we went out for dinner and I ate whipped cream and was on the floor, the bathroom floor in a like fetal position because because I didn't know that whipped cream wasn't good for me to this point. So they put me on the FODMAP diet and I'm sure a lot of your followers are familiar with this. You're familiar with it, right, Wendy? I haven't heard of that one. There's so many. I try not to get my women to have diets per se, but more just like, you know, consider them, you know, follow the, like what were their great, great ancestors doing on the plains? You know, just trying to eat as yeah. fresh, as natural, yeah. and as, you know, uninterfered with by human factories as possible. But so I try not well, to do a diet because I think people then only do it for a couple of weeks. Whereas we talk about healthy eating habits, which is why I was so happy to have you on because when you talk about methods and the how, that fits into healthy eating habits. But no, I'm curious. I mean, what what is it? Well, it's not, and I agree with you. The word diet means what you eat every day. Di- diet is like a cow grazes in a field. That's his diet. It's not something you do for six weeks. But the FODMAP is a medical diet. This is something that your doctor will put you on. And very often in uh, the, the path toward diagnosing endometriosis, I think a lot of your people might have gone across this bridge because doctors love to do this. They put you on the FODMAP. And it's, if I can remember, it, it's every, anything fermentable basically is excluded. Fermentable, old geosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, and polyols that are, that are removed from your diet. Basically nothing can you now eat. So my <laughs> point is I got put on this horrible diet and it, it was, you know, when you're faced with not eating everything that you like, when you're faced with a sudden diagnosis that is going to change your life that way, I panicked and I started cooking their recipes, their FODMAP recipes. And it was horrible. You know, I I was restricted in so many ways. And a a diagnosis that can be cured with food, that can be cured with diet, like so many of these things, you start out by thinking that you're being restricted. Absolutely. Right. It's a negative attitude. And I didn't even take my own advice. I followed their (laughs) recipes. I love you're being so honest with it. This is wonderful. Well, think about it. When a doctor tells you to do something, you don't second guess them, right? This was my health. We We should stop and go, but, but you're right. We tend to not think and just do, yeah. I'm going to do it like as if the doctor was a better chef than I was. I didn't think I was a better doctor <laughs> than he was. So I followed their recipes. It was terrible until I started saying, oh, Todd, you know, get back to what you've taught thousands of people all over the world. And I returned to my methods. I returned to the basic cooking methods, yeah. but took the foods that I could and couldn't have and then apply that method. So if I was making, I don't know, something luxurious, like a chicken parmesan with mozzarella cheese and tomato sauce, oh my goodness, all the dairy and the acid, (laughs) you know, in there would have exploded my stomach back then. That's what I wanted to make. But I could, I could make some semblance of that. You know, I could roast the chicken breast instead of breading it and frying it. Exactly. Um, instead of the tomatoes, you know, maybe I would do carrots that are naturally sweet. And I would be uh, cooking with lentils or beans more than the, the carbohydrates, and, although you can't have beans on the FODMAP. Um, but things like that. But my point is the substitutions got me through it. And eventually I already buried the lead. I told you, yeah, I can't have whipped cream <laughs> anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what it came down to. So well, that's it, to the I think our, our foods of things have changed so much. They're so overprocessed, you know, even like, you know, our milks and our creams and things like that are just not, you know, they're boiled you know, to such a degree that you'd be able to have these things if they weren't manufactured through processing plants, you know, and our intestinal tracts are not designed to, to handle these things because the formulation of them has changed. You know, and that, that's that's the problem. That's why we have these, you know, um, bloated stomachs and intestinal issues. And that's why over long periods of time, the, the intestinal tract becomes so inflamed and, and so sensitive to these things. But what I'm hearing from you is, I, I mean, I love the methods, but 
and even the way that you are talking about it and you're simplifying it in such a way that you're not making food complicated because I think there's so many people out there that make it not only complicated and then try and simplify it with their marketing skills like here's something you just stick in the microwave for two minutes but it's bland it's tasteless it, they've removed the sugar uh, sorry they've removed this, they've added salt and sugar to make it taste good and removed fats in inverted commas so actually what you're getting is a nutritionally vaporized you know plastic thing rather than something that's full of flavor and i think for you even just you talking about the chicken and sorting the vegetables it's amazing how that simple even just that simple dish or even with fish or a piece of meat or something can be so tasty that it actually evokes your taste buds again mm-hmm. uh, people tell me all the time chef todd i hate fish or chef todd i hate this and that now, my mother always made it and i hate it now i learned how to cook it right yeah. and i love fish or beans or whatever it might be. Yeah, so much of it comes down to the skills in cooking it. And what happens to, to these people that follow me that, that wind up cooking by method? Uh, they become carefree cooks. Uh, yes. Cooking is not stressful. Cooking is not life or death anymore because you're, uh, of your diagnosis. This word diet that we've talked about, it does become like your habitat diet. It's what you eat all the time, every day, and you become comfortable with it. And then you don't feel restricted and then you're joyous and your, your attitude lifts. You're in harmony with things. How could that not positively affect your body? Absolutely. And I think that's it. I think when, when we try, there's so much information out there. Sometimes we can hit overwhelm and then you don't feel hungry. And I think that's the sad thing. Then you're kind of, you, you know, you have to eat or you would die. And I think that's, that was what my old methodology, whereas I was like, oh God, I, I don't know what to eat. So I'd feel overwhelmed and then end up not eating properly. And that's why I ended up as ill as I did. But then discovering food in a new way, a new way of working with food and just trying to keep it simple. I think what worked for me, as I mentioned before, is imagining my great, great, great ancestors, cavemen, cavewomen, wandering around the plains. You know, they ate quite simply. You know, it was beautiful, fresh food, you know, and, it, you know, it wasn't filled with, you know, all sorts of, you know, antibiotics, hormones, you know, it, it was filled with good. So you mentioned the farmer's market. And I think that's an interesting thing. So for someone who's only ever shopped at uh, Walmart or big superstores or um, had their food delivered to their home, how would you, I think some people feel a bit scared of the idea of farmer's market. Like how do they even know what to look for, how to buy? Uh, what, what are some top tips you might give some of my women if they're thinking, right, okay, I'm going to go for it this weekend. I'm going to try this hot pan, hot fat chicken thing. I'm going to impress my family. Where, where should they go? What should they do? Well, shopping at the farmer's market, to me, makes shopping fun. Shopping at, at the mega store, pushing a cart in front of me, it just seems so industrial. I just, it's not fun. And I'm a person who loves everything about food. I love cooking food. I love what it does for my health and my attitude. So how I go procure my food is, is part of it. But look, I get this a lot. The farmer's market is more expensive. The farmer's market is a distance away. Uh, the farmer's market, you know, I, I don't know what to buy and I certainly don't know what to cook it. And this time of year when we have like these gourds and squashes that are harder than rocks, you know, people don't immediately go, oh, let me buy that ugly thing that's harder than a rock and see if I could cook it, you know? So there's that intimidation factor for it as well. So let me, let me address some of these. The farmer's market is more expensive. No. Farmer's market is definitely not more expensive because when you push your iron cart around the industrial grocery store, you buy twice as much as what you need, and then you cook twice as much as what you need, and then you throw out twice as much as what you need. When you, far when you shop at the farmer's market, you'll find yourself buying only what you're going to cook and cooking only what you bought. So that limits it in that respect because I don't have a cart. I have maybe three or four um, recyclable bags with me, and I'm only buying because it's fresh. What's the sense of buying something at the farmer's market and keeping it in your refrigerator for two weeks? You know, I'm only going to buy for that day. Um, the farmer's market is far away. That, that might be the case, but, you know, it, it's worth it to go get the food that is grown. Uh, the French have a term called terroir. Uh, and they don't say it like an American. They say terroir, you know, something <laughs> like that. Um, but terroir is the sun, the soil, the love of the farmer. Yeah. And there are a lot of people that say that food that is grown in the soil native to you in your area has the antibodies, has the, the natural minerals that you need. E eating strawberries from Chile 
it is not going to help your health in that regard. So drive a little further for that benefit, I would say. Um, the fact that you don't know what's there, ask them. The farmers love to talk to you. Ask the guy at Walmart, hey, pardon, do you know what this is? Uh, what? <laughs> When's my break? You know, the Walmart guy is not passionate about food. He's passionate about putting his eight hours in and going home. The farmer would love to talk to you about what to do with a rutabaga, what to do with an acorn squash, because I'm sure in his family, that's pretty much all they eat when they have fields of them. So he knows what to do with them. Talk to him. And then another benefit, you've met someone. Yeah. You, you have a new friend. You're more involved with your food and you leave with only two or three reusable bags of only the food you're going to buy. And you know what? Even if you leave thinking that it was more expensive, you gave that money to a farmer. You gave that money to someone in your community. Give your money to Walmart. Where do you think that goes? You know, so all these things are benefits of going to the farmer's market. And I say, immodestly, if you cook by method, by basic cooking methods, then you can just grab anything from the farmer's market and apply the nine steps in the basic saute method to it. And now it's all solved. So that, that's, I would urge people to find the fresh, if you're eating for health, my goodness, find the freshest foods, cook it best, and you retain the texture, the color, the nutrition of it every time. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for sharing that because I think that these are great tips. And, and I agree, anytime that I go to the farmer's market, it's it's a lovely engagement and process. You know, you're you're asking about the food. And, and I know I felt a bit hesitant and wary the first time that I went. I felt a bit alien. I didn't know what to do. I didn't even know that you you had to sort of speak to someone about the food, but it, the more you got over that rather than just picking up a piece of meat that's, you know, covered in cling film and plastic and goodness knows, you know, how many hands have, have touched that piece of meat before you, you know, get it, get it home. And um, it felt really nice to almost like be part of the community, part of the whole process of the food, um, the food element before it comes, gets cooked and put on your plate and into your body. And of course, you know, it has such a profound impact on your health. I think not even just the physical elements because you're bypassing all the, you know, whatever has been, you know, uh, put into that food, but you're also mentally getting out, getting to understand and appreciate the food that's coming into your body, knowing its origin sources and finding out a bit more about that as well. And just starting to have a love of food again, because I think a lot of people, when they've been ill for so long, it's the last thing they feel like doing is cooking. But sometimes even just getting out, as you say, to go to the farmer's market and to see all the colours and all the different variety, you know, presented in such that way is fantastic. Mm. So if people are inspired, which I'm sure they will be now, Todd, um, how can they get more information on your recipes? Um, and I know that you have an online cooking school and things as well. How can they get more information from you? Uh, well, they can find out more at webcookingclasses.com uh, or go to my Facebook page, find Chef Todd Moore, T-O-D-D-M-O-H-R. And that's where all the live broadcasts are being uh, done. That's where the, the up to the minute things are as well. So I, I look forward to helping everyone that I can. Just finding a, a, a great joy in cooking because it can be creative. It can be fun. It can be confident building, you know, and, and family reuniting and certainly have a big impact on your health. And that's that's the word that I want to spread. Yeah, absolutely. And I think just even the confidence building, I think sometimes when, when someone's ill, you know, I know myself when I was ill, the last thing I felt like doing was cooking. But as I started to feel better, I understood the different impacts food had on my body and actually how much my body loved fresh food. Like my body just will repel anything that it, it doesn't like now, that it is artificial, that is full of of, of rubbish. In fact, one of my students emailed me the other day and said, it's so annoying. I want to eat rubbish, but my body doesn't like it anymore. <laughs> and I'm like, yay. You know, and I think part of this process is just learning to, to be curious and to keep it simple. You know, keep it super simple. And, and thank you so much for sharing all that. Well, oh, thank you, Wendy. Um, thank you so much for coming on. I know this will be of great value to my women. And for those of you who are listening, um, please do go and visit Todd and get some more information, even just hear and see what he's doing just to feel inspired and don't feel under any pressure, but just start to kind of like and even love food again. For those of you who haven't got my paperback book, um, know that you can go and get a free paperback copy worth $14.99 at heal and dot com. And I just ask you to pay shipping and I ship all over the world. 
and um, remember to subscribe and rate me and share this post so we can get more and more women feeling supported who have endometriosis. But in the meantime, Todd, thank you so much for being on and I look forward to chatting to you again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, Wendy. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Heal Endometriosis Naturally with Wendy K. Laidlaw. And I hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and rate us. If you're interested in learning more, you can download your top five jumpstart tips at healendometriosisnaturally.com and jump on the VIP email list. Remember to keep you number one. The world needs a healthy you.